1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to just separate this verse from the context. Don't think it'll do great harm, but uh, I want to separate this verse, which is verse 45. It simply says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, the last Adam, was made a quickening spirit. What is said in this verse goes beyond my human comprehension. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, it's going to help introduce our subject for this conference, the things that I have to say about this verse. So if you can bear with me in my scribbling, I'm going to spend some time at the board here. And what I want to do here is put a blockhead up here called Adam. This is a living spirit. No, this is a living soul. You really understand what a living soul is. God breathed into Adam a breath of life and made him a living soul. You'll be surprised how miscomprehended that statement is by great numbers of people. There are some that believe that at that moment everybody receives something from God. Air is not God. It's something that's all around us here. So he breathed into them air, like if I gave resuscitation to somebody who had lost their breath or drowned or something, had water in them. Uh, I wouldn't be giving them any part of myself. I'd be giving them air that's out there for everybody. You have to have air. So a living soul constitutes air. A living soul is what we are. In fact, another word for this would be self. What is a human self? It's a living soul. A human self is the accumulation of everything that's gone to make that human who they think they are or who they think they should be. So that puts a whole list of stuff that constitutes a living soul. Every human has a living soul. He can live and die in that understanding, a soul. But he can easily have a misunderstanding. For instance, in the Old Testament, to get the soul saved was how God dealt with people. That's Old Testament. That belongs under the law. That's a key part of the kingdom message. Notice what I'm saying. Has nothing to do with being born again. Has nothing to do with being saved by grace. Has nothing to do with being washed in the blood. So there's a keen distinction between the word soul in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The distinction is in the soul, God saves souls. Now you see how misconception can come out of that because that's the way we talk today as believers. We say, well, I'm going to get that soul saved. Uh, we put on a crusade and we say, we're going to have a soul winning crusade. We're going to save souls. But that's Old Testament. Because a soul saved may not be a soul who is born again at all. And so I wanted to get that before you. And remember, I'm in an introductory part of what our theme will be during this conference. What is a human soul? Well, in the human soul, we have all sorts of things. We have attitude. That makes up the human being. It's whatever makes up the human being. Uh, the human being has certain morals. Uh, the human being has religion. Religion. Did you know that 90% of people 
who are saved today consider their salvation to be a religious thing. The world considers them to be religious people. You can be that if you never heard of Jesus Christ. You can be religious. I run into religious people all the time. I, I saw on television the other day a snake handler. He's very religious. <laughs> Anybody can be religious. All cults have very religious people in them. Sports people are very religious at what they do. So that doesn't have anything to do with a change in nature, which we'll get to later. So a living soul can be very religious. All human beings have certain talents. Uh, has certain desires. Every human being has unique abilities. Every human being uh, has vision. Sane ones do. They have a personality. Uh, they have a certain breeding or a certain birthing. They are of a certain race or ethnicity. Let's just put race there. Race becomes ethnicity whenever who you are in your race is more important to you than anything else. Uh, a lot of folks are like that. We have Germans that uh, only want to be as Germans. Italians only want to be as Italians and so forth. We all have a profession. You see, that list could be endless of what a living soul is. Every one of us have bits, pieces, and parts of every one of these terms operating in you. You're a living soul, and that makes the human self. Well, over here, We're going to put another circle. This circle is Christ. Now what happens when a person becomes a Christian? The definition of what a Christian is is an unknown factor, technically. I don't think anybody has ever really discovered all that a Christian is. To most people, a Christian is a makeup of any number of things. And finally, when you get settled in some building somewhere, it has a special name on it. That's what a Christian is. So that's a growing thing, a Christian. But we've gone beyond that point to where we see that we're in Christ. The human being is in Christ. Now, this is what I want you to see. At some juncture of life, everything this living soul is, is going to have to become a part of Christ if it becomes God's intention. Our text says, Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Well, right off we have a necessity here for some technical knowledge. The only one in the Bible who ever made a distinction between soul and spirit was the Apostle Paul. That's because he knew what a human being was more than anybody else in this book. That was a part of the information that Christ gave him in the final gospel as what a human being is. 
So Paul wrote that a human being as a living soul is one thing. That's Adam. That's our first natural father birthing. But when we become saved, spiritual people, we have a quickening spirit, and that's what Christ is. Well, now the objective of God for every human being is that they take this trip from being a living soul to a living Christ. We have scripture for that. Over in Colossians, first chapter, verse 13 says, and you need to mark this. It says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Ah. What was to happen when you were saved? When you were saved, God's intention was that you, with everything you are, would be translated into Christ. Well, it says into the kingdom of His dear Son. So what we're going to have to do here is digress for a moment because this is a very important subject. The word kingdom is used many times in the New Testament. But it must be rightly divided when it is read. Because when Jesus says it, it means something entirely different than when Paul says it. When Peter says it, it means something entirely different than when Paul says it. The word kingdom, in most times that it is used in the Scriptures, the New Testament, is used by Christ and His followers and means the kingdom of heaven on earth. Jesus said to the disciples when He first called them, Go preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What was that? That was the kingdom that would be established on earth. What is that kingdom? That's a kingdom that belongs to Israel. It is an earthly kingdom. You see, that kingdom would have been established by Jesus when he was here if the Jews as a government, as a nation, had accepted him as Messiah. When they turned him down, then everything that had to do with that kingdom was set aside. Acts 28, 28 says that Israel had become deaf, dumb, and blind, and the gospel now would go to the Gentiles. So there was a revolutionary, radical change in God's plan that the word kingdom used by Christ, who was here to be king of the kingdom, had to be set aside because of disobedience and the fact that they did not accept their Messiah. They will accept that Messiah. All of the promises concerning with that will take place. All the covenants and promises made to Israel will take place, but they are not in effect now and cannot be in effect until Israel as a nation accepts her Messiah. That won't happen till Jesus comes back to this earth and sits on the throne in Jerusalem. Do you understand that? Don't be caught up with the idea that the church has become the fulfillment of any of those things. It is not and never will be. It wasn't intended to be. But the word kingdom is used by the translators when Paul talks. He uses it in several places, like this verse we're talking about, that we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Well, that's the most explanatory term I could give you, because the kingdom that belongs to Israel, and one day all the nations who join Israel in the millennium, will be an earthly kingdom. But when Paul says we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, that's a heavenly kingdom. That's a whole different state. That's a whole different location and has a whole different meaning. Sadly, the translators did not explain all that just by using the word kingdom. But that word radically changed when the gospel was given to the apostle Paul. You'll find that Paul in his last days was sitting in the rented house he had still under 
uh, Roman bondage, and it says that he was teaching people about the kingdom of God. But what was that kingdom? That was the kingdom of his dear son. Paul never at any time taught that any part of the kingdom that belongs to Israel belongs to any born-again believer. Why in the world would I want this earth even made better when I have a home with my Father in heaven? So the scripture's clear on that if you're ready to see it. Well, here we have a living soul. And the scripture says, we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Isn't that good? Does not fit everything Paul teaches us? We're in Christ. We've been baptized into his body in Christ. Everything's in Christ in Paul's message. And so we were translated there. That's a, that's a good word. Because that's not a word that just says uh, uh, you woke up one day and you was there or you, you did a lot of good works and you got there. It means that God by His grace translated every one of us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Sounds good, doesn't it? But you're probably still wondering how you got there. Because most believers have a greater consciousness of being a living soul and identified with the first Adam than they have with the last Adam, Christ. Our identification is still in all of these things. That's who we are. We're not going to spend a lifetime getting rid of those things. We're going to spend a lifetime trying to perfect them. Some spend a lifetime making some of them worse. But the endeavor of a human being is to make better certain things that have happened in his life. So we're all spending our life trying to get a better attitude, better morals, a better religion, better desires, better profession. We're all after something better. All of this has to do with Adam. That's just natural. When you came into this world, your mother and father were recipients of the seed that came from Adam back in the beginning. So your great, 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 great grandfather is Adam. You are of the seed of Adam. Now if God's going to have a family of his own, he'd like not to have it premised on the one fellow who fouled up everything on this earth. You see, the reason why God gave the earth to Israel was that it was his hope that Israel would obey him and do something that Adam had not done. Adam was given the power to rule over the earth. I give unto you power over all the things that are alive, over every tree, every animal, everything. God gave him the power and authority to run this world. And it might help you to know that there's not going to be any forthcoming politicians they'll ever be able to run this earth. Are you aware of that? Nobody since Adam has ever been able to run this world. Well, there'll be a bit of a change in that for a few days when the Antichrist comes along, but that's a part of the business that has to do with Israel. It has nothing to do with us. But nobody has ever had the power and authority to do anything on this earth to run it, to make it right. We got translated into the kingdom of his son. But you see, there's not very many people who teach that. You see, when you were put into the kingdom of this son, you were no longer a square head with Adam. You became a believer in Christ. That's your position. That's your standing with God. How is it you lived all your years and didn't know about that? How is it you grew up probably in a good church, good preachers, and they never told you about being in Christ? How is it you read all the books you read in religion and never were gripped by any statement in it that said you were in Christ and Christ was in you? How did that happen? 
I have people ask me that all the time. I ask myself that. Oh, back in 1960 when I first saw the in Christ message, I said to God, how could I have been trained? I've been through university, seminary. I've uh, been the head of two different colleges. And I've heard the greatest speakers and the greatest preachers in our day, and I never heard any of them talk about this. How in the world could that happen? Well, the Lord didn't answer him. I think the Holy Spirit might have whispered and said, it's been in the book all the time. You're just blind. <laughs> How did it happen? How did it happen? How is it happening that you can live a lifetime today and never come to that knowledge. So what is it religion does? This is what religion does. Religion takes every one of these things that make up a human being and tries to better it. Our forefathers are the greatest liar that ever lived. In a sense, that's not much of a testimony, but religion is trying to better what our forefather did. We get a better attitude. How many sermons you had on having a good attitude? And they pick scripture out of the Bible everywhere. Morality. How come the world is so immoral today? Religion's done its best to try to make us moral, has it not? We've got all kinds of rules and regulations. Uh, we start with the Ten Commandments, add 640 laws from the Torah plus all the laws of the denomination and plus all the laws that particular preacher has. By the time you got through, there's no book that could hold all the laws that's been laid on this dear living soul here. We've done nothing but try to better people. Was that God's plan? Was it ever God's intention to better Adam? The text says, Adam was made a living soul. He was made a living soul. You'll never understand God's plan until you separate soul and spirit. Why did Paul say that? Where's that over in Hebrews 4? God gave him that information as a part of the final gospel because if human beings didn't understand the separation of soul and spirit, they would never come into God's plan. That's why you can sit in a church building for 50 years and never hear the in Christ message. It's because soul and spirit have never been separated. The preacher is still trying to get your soul saved. And your soul never will be saved. That part of you never will be straightened out. In fact, when the gospel went to the Gentiles, God gave up trying to straighten out human beings. I hope this is a help to some of you that are trying to get it all fixed right. Because God never intended to straighten out your life. You say, well, I thought that's what the Bible is all about. Not at all. Not the final gospel. The gospel of the kingdom, which has to do with all of these things that are earthly, always tells you to get such and such straightened out. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. Commands here. Commands there. Law here. Law there. The apostle Paul never lays down one law in the final gospel. God's not going to straighten out human beings anymore. The Apostle Paul never dealt with getting souls saved anymore. God took care of that Himself because when people were filled with the Holy Spirit, where does the Holy Spirit work? Only in the soul. Where is the life? In the Son, Christ. So it was never God's intention to straighten all that out. 
It was never His intention to make you think right. Do right. In our new Church in the Home uh, video series, I spent some time on the subject of the commandments that are in grace. Grace has commandments. But every one of those commandments are love commandments. I have counted 377 commandments that Paul gives. And I haven't gotten through the book of Hebrews yet. 377 of them up to the book of Hebrews. All commands. But not a one of them has a judgment attached to it. Not a one of them says if you don't do this you'll go to hell. Not a one. There's no judgment in grace. So it's so important to separate soul and spirit. If you don't start with that understanding, you'll never grow up in Christ. So we've been translated. But how did that translation take place? Out of this little scribbling I've done on the board, I've left out the most important thing God ever did. It's the connection between these two lives. At least spell that right. I? I-S-T. Got to spell wrong over here too. What's left out of this picture? Most important thing God ever did. When I make a blank statement to you that says God never intended that you live the Christian life, I'll write that mean right. When I say to you that God's not in the business of straightening out your life, how in the world can I get by with that? Because that's what you think religion is, and actually that's what religion is. Religion is man's attempt to straighten us out. To correct us. To get us fixed right. To open us up to any and all things that was in God's intention. The cross. The cross of Christ. God has to do something Himself that's akin to the creation of a living soul, the first great thing he did to get this thing fixed. He did it at Calvary. He did it at the cross. I'm going to tell you some things about the cross that may upset you a bit. But when people come to me and say, why didn't we know about the in Christ message? I'm going to tell you plainly, you don't understand the cross. That seems strange, doesn't it? Because there's more than one of you that's got one hanging around your neck now. Some of you got one in your ear. You go to buildings that have them on, except uh, I noticed a lot of Reformed churches here have roosters on them. I don't know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> I never have figured out what that meant. <laughs> but the cross. Everybody knows about the cross. That's the best selling piece of jewelry there is. The cross. 
But I'm here to tell you that the problem in Christianity has to do with the cross. What is it that translated us from the kingdom of darkness to Christ, the light? What did that? It was a cross. So I want to tell you something bluntly. The cross belongs to the born again. It doesn't belong to religion. It doesn't belong to orthodoxy. The cross belongs to the born again. Everybody uses it just like everybody can wear one. I saw a fellow the other day that had one uh, hanging around his neck, a big one. I said, that's a pretty big cross. Yeah, he said, Mama makes me wear that. <laughs> but it didn't belong to him. Cross really had nothing to do with him. How many songs we have written about the cross? It's a very popular thing. So I'm going to tell you that the cross really belongs to grace. Now when I mention the word cross, I mean more than just the death of Jesus Christ. Because Christ died for our sins. Paul said that. But that's only half of what happened. The cross goes deeper into God's message than I'll ever be able to explain or tell you about. But the cross belongs to grace. I just jotted down several things it doesn't belong to. The cross belongs to grace, not to covenant people. Why? A covenant is where you place yourself under a law. There are no such things in grace. The cross does not belong to holiness people. Now I'm saying this figuratively because most holiness people believe in the cross. But it doesn't belong to them because they still think there's something they have to do to please God. The cross doesn't belong to faith people. People in faith ministries are constantly telling you if you don't get any more faith, you won't get what you want from God. Isn't that so? You ever hear one of them? I used to be one of them. The cross doesn't belong to faith people. The cross doesn't belong to signs, wonders, and miracles people. Because once again, their understanding of God is premised on you doing something. I digress for a moment. How many times you've taken one of these things and tried to change it in your own life? How hard you work on it? It's like trying to lose weight, isn't it? You did it for a little while, but finding it to be you, you had to go back and Pick it up again. Cross doesn't belong to circumcision people. Cross doesn't belong to Judaizers. That's the people who are trying to get the church to take over Israel's covenants and promises. Cross doesn't belong to them. If if they can take over Judaism, what do they need a cross for? Cross doesn't belong to Pentecostals. Now, all of these people I've mentioned that you are attaching names to, as I gave them to you, are people who preach the cross one way or another, but doesn't belong to them. Because as long as anybody works 
at attempting within them all selves to become something. They don't need this cross. As long as you think you have to do something to please God, you don't need the cross. I can tell, I can hear it already. It's going through your mind. My Lord, I've been doing those things. <laughs> you don't need the cross. That's why I'm telling you, there's things about the cross we don't understand. Don't come to me and tell me that you believe in salvation that you received at the cross. And then tell me you must do something to live a better Christian life. They don't mix. They're two different things. I want to get you into Christ with an understanding of how you got there. I want you to have an understanding of this translation. You don't go from a living soul to a living Christ. So let's mark that out. You go from a living soul through this cross. You'll be surprised how many people come to my meetings and say, oh, I got it. I got just what you're saying. I understand that, just what you're saying. We've gotten from what we are to in Christ. No, not if you don't understand the cross. You got, you got to know about that cross. You have to understand what that cross is all about. Because you see, if you understand the cross and you went through the cross with understanding, then your in Christ position would be fixed properly. Well, you say, didn't we all go through the cross? There's no other salvation. You're right. You can be saved. Scripture says that. I go back to Paul's statement, the one that I'll quote more than anybody else. The Apostle Paul says that we are saved by the cross. But that scripture doesn't give us the full understanding. That's only one half of the understanding. So it is possible for you to go this route here to get to the in Christ position by saying, sure, Jesus has saved me. I believe he died for my sins. And I believe I'm going to go to heaven. And I believe I'm ready for the in Christ message. But you bypass the cross and what it means. So the subject of this conference is going to be what happens right here. What happens to a human being that understands what took place at the cross? And the first thing I have to tell you about that is that you must have an understanding between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of grace. Dual religion is based on a kingdom message. The kingdom message is based on what you do. Are you aware of that? You never thought of that, maybe. I have a lot of dear friends in faith ministries, and they're irritated when I make this distinction that you're telling everybody it's free except they need to get faith not free there, is it? It's not free unless they're standing on the Word. Isn't that right? It's not free unless you're given a good offering. Never heard a faith preacher that didn't want an offering with it. What is all that? That all has to do with the kingdom message because the kingdom is based on what you do. 
That's why it's best to say it belongs to Israel because they never did do it. That's why they're set aside right now. Israel never did do what God told them to do and she won't be picked up till the millennium. So that's a doer religion. You have to know the difference between what you do and what God did. So we're back to this line here. You can bypass the cross by saying, yes, I've already believed on the Lord. You talk to somebody about the Christ. Yes, I believe that. Yes, I believe I'm in Christ. You ever talk to anybody like that? They just come right out and say, yes, I believe that. That's what I've always believed. That's what my preacher preached. You know what they did? They bypassed the cross. That didn't mean that the cross is not where Jesus died for their sins. It means that in their own personal life, they don't understand the cross. The kingdom message ignores the cross. We'll get more into that in a moment. So you have to know the difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of grace. This is why our preachers so violently fight grace. They like to say we're sinners saved by grace, but don't take it too far or I won't have you doing anything we need to have done. So you need first a keen distinction. You can bypass the cross as a part of your life by just simply saying Jesus died for my sins. Another thing you need to see Most who preach the kingdom message commingle the cross in it. Let me show you the difference between somebody who says Christ died for our sins and when he died they put stripes on his back and by his stripes we're healed. Believe that. What is in that statement? Two things. Something you must do and something God did. What do we call that? That's a commingle gospel. Commingle. You know what commingle is? You got a whole bunch of stuff and it's like braided hair. I saw a bunch of it here a while ago. Commingled hair. Braided. All mixed up. You can make it look pretty. Now I've seen some braided hair that's beautiful. A gospel could be like that, commingle, all mixed up to where you hear a statement here and a statement there, and you say, well, look at there, it's all there, saying the whole thing. It's commingle. Remember, anything that's mixed up is not pure. I'm not talking about hair now, I'm talking about truth. <laughs> it's mixed up. The gospel of the kingdom message does not present the cross as an intricate part of God's plan. I came to this watching some of my brethren on television. I noticed one thing about them. They never got too close to the subject of the cross. The subject was happiness, joy, peace, health, healing, deliverance. But never was it the cross in its proper distinction. It was so commingled. Why was that? I asked one of my friends one time, television preacher. I said, why don't you preach the cross more? He said, it's simple. I'm on television reaching a buried audience. And I don't want to bring up anything bloody to them. I want to try to reach them without them thinking that way. I didn't rebuke him. Because that's the way most people are in religion. They just don't want to think that way. I hope 
your thinking can change at the close of this conference. Let's look at the record. The first message we have in the Bible after Jesus died on the cross was preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost. He didn't say that, folks, the greatest thing that's ever happened has taken place. And everybody that believes that Jesus died for their sins could be saved. And everybody that comes to the knowing of God's plan will know that not only did Jesus die, but the second part of the gospel, you died. Did Peter preach that on the day of Pentecost? Did he preach that at the beautiful gate? Did he preach that in his epistle? No, sir. Why? He's a kingdom preacher. He doesn't preach the cross. What did he preach about the cross on the day of Pentecost? He said, you Jews kill him on that cross. You murdered him. Is that preaching the cross? No, that's a historical event. That's really what happened. I've always thought that not only was the Holy Spirit so moving on that day that 3,000 got saved, but the time Peter got through preaching law to them, they were afraid to move away and not believe on Jesus Christ. You made murderers out of all of them. They needed to do something. You ever been in a church service like that? Did you know that the word cross is mentioned in the four Gospels only as a historical event? Only as a historical event. Atheists believe that. Cults believe that. Romanism believes that. Most preachers preach that. But the cross is never mentioned as a place where lives are changed in the four Gospels. The word cross is mentioned three times in the book of Acts and once again it's mentioned as a historical factor. Never as salvation. It's mentioned once in the book of Revelation. Once again, as a historical fact. Why did I bring that out? It's because I think we don't know and understand what happened at the cross. Six times in Paul's epistles, he gives us a depth scripture as to what happened at the cross. He says, God forbid that I should glory in anything except the cross of Christ. The apostle would say, that I don't want to know anything except Christ and Him crucified. So we have to go to Paul to find out what happened at the cross. Why is the cross so lightly talked about by the followers of Jesus of Nazareth? The answer to that is another question you can answer. Why did God raise up a whole new and different preacher who knew not Christ as Jesus of Nazareth, who was a Judaizer destroying followers of Christ, why did God have to do that? Because if our Bible had been left without Paul talking about the cross, 
we would have never known what changes the life of a human being. We would have still had a gospel where everybody said, yeah, I'm in Christ and I'm going to pray more so I can be more like Him. See, a mixed up message. An untruth. Why was the cross so hated? You need to mark this scripture. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 12. Now follow me closely. Because this is a verse of scripture not worded. As well as I'd like for it to have been. The Lord can be glad I didn't write the Bible. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they can, I'm at verse 12. What did I say? Galatians 6 and 12. And as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Now there are two very important things said in this verse. The first is where the followers of Christ, Judaistic believers, and kingdom people were in their walk. It's stated in that verse. There are many that want you to make a show of your religion in your flesh. What is that? That's the epitome of your religion. I grew up in it. Grew up in a holiness church. If you don't do right, if you don't talk right, if you don't dress right, if you don't go to the right places, and if you don't do what the preacher says, Heavy law. Why do they want me to do that in the church? So the preacher could look down on the front row and say, folks, there's little Warren. He's living the life. He's holy. I was in a church service one time where the preacher looked down at the front rows and they had five women sitting there. He didn't have hardly anybody else in the crowd. <clears throat> but he said, there's the five most godly women there are. What was that? They knew a fair show in the flesh. They made a fair show in the flesh. That's what we call religion. If you're trying to change these things, that's where you're trying to make a fair show in the flesh. Why do so many people hate the cross? I laid the groundwork for it. I told you about a lot of religious people that won't have anything to do with the cross. You know why? Because the latter part of this verse says that if they preached the cross, there would be persecution on them because they had been demanding a fair show in the flesh. And the cross does not demand that. Makes no demand of that. These people hated the cross. It was there. They had to face it. Jesus died on it. But they disliked it. And the whole book of Galatians deals with that. We'll go back to that if I have enough time in this conference. You need to see that. They disliked the cross. Oh, thank God He died for our sins. But that only triggered in people. Now we're going to use that as a means of demanding from people what we want them to be. Why did they dislike the cross? Because it destroyed the law of Moses. Get it now. 
are getting to the heart of this crude drawing on the board here. What did the cross do? Why would people want to bypass it? In the scriptures, it was because it destroyed the law of Moses and they could not and would not give up the law of Moses. The kingdom message is established on the law of Moses. How many times today are you hearing preachers say, folks, we've got to keep the law. We've got to have the law of Moses. Did you know the cross destroyed the law of Moses? Took it away. Now you know why preachers don't like to preach Paul. Because that destroys this thing where man has power over men. I can't look at you and say, folks, you better straighten up and do right or you're going to go to hell or something. <clears throat> the cross took that away. The cross destroyed that. Ephesians 2 and 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments. Would you circle that? What died in Christ? The law of commandments. Moses' law. The Torah. Any law that man could make, they were destroyed in his body. Having destroyed in his flesh the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, named it all there, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. That's why religion hates grace because you can't preach grace and not preach that the law died its ordinances its commandments they all died in his body on the cross they died there well I can hear somebody think of my lord if it took away all the law and commands nobody would be serving God you're wrong it's just the opposite of that. Grace makes it possible for you to live for God by another life. Grace is easy. Law is hard. In His body that was destined to die body that wouldn't be worth a penny when they got through with it so that everything that went into that body would be just as dead as that body was that's the law that's the law there's another scripture that says it was abolished at the cross you can't get away from it. The new gospel given to Paul by Jesus Christ was based on what he did at that cross and not based on what happens to man when they believe. They must believe. But that's not where the power is. Power is in the cross. I want to ask you a question. If he bore it all, your sin and Moses' law and every ordinance, if he bore it in his body, how could you do anything within yourself 
that would be more important than what he did on that cross. First Corinthians chapter one. First Corinthians chapter one. <clears throat> Paul has been talking about his water baptism experience. He talked about baptizing a few people. He named off all he could think of, which wasn't very many. But look at verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of non-effect. Christians kill each other over water baptism. Why did Paul make this statement? Because there are a lot of people that don't baptize in water anymore because of this statement. Why did he make it? It came to him that when he had pulled these people to the water and put them into the water and brought them up out of the water, the thought hit him, my God, where's the cross in this? Am I having to finish something that took place at the cross? Am I to do something now that completes what Jesus did? Am I finishing what he did? He says, I'll never baptize another one. Why? Because of the cross. The understanding of the cross brought him to that place. See, that's a hard subject, isn't it? Because we've all been raised, I've baptized hundreds of people. But I didn't have the message of the cross like I do now. Anything, anything you do, even a sanctimonious thing as water baptism, nullifies in Paul's teaching a certain place in the cross. We're all taught that when you get saved, the first thing you got to do to, to make sure you're saved, make sure you're straightened out, make sure you're going to live it, is get water baptized. I've had people to come to me desperately. Not long ago, a woman came to me so desperately that I had to baptize her in a, in a bathroom tub. Boy, it's hard to get her under there. <laughs> She was so desperate. She didn't feel saved. And I knew then that, my, that made the cross void. You say, well, it's just a testimony to the world. When I want to testify to the world, I look at one of those crosses hanging around your neck or hanging on your wall, and I point to it and I say, that's where Litzman died. Another gospel. Another gospel. Go with me to Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. One of my favorite verses, verse 17. I'm glad it shows up right here. Philippians 3 and 17. Brethren... Be followers together of me. Ha, I'm glad he said that because he's the only one who had this gospel. Christ only gave it to him. Eight times Paul says, follow me. He doesn't leave it in doubt. 
He says, you better follow me. I'm the only one that has this gospel. He's the only one that knew to separate soul and spirit. He's the only one that knew that man was a tripartite man. And now we see he's the only one that knew what really happened at the cross and writes about it. Verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. They can be in the kingdom message and all of those things be so and be saved. But the next verse lifts us up for our conversation. Our daily walk is in heaven from which we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if Paul stood before you, he would be honored. You're a blessed, gracious group of people. But if he stood before you, he would tell you that anybody that does not preach what I preach, I consider an enemy of the cross. He didn't just say that here. He started out in Galatians saying that if anybody preach any gospel other than that which I preach, let them be cursed. A curse. He never beats around the bush. He got the message from Jesus and the message was different than anything else in the Bible. The message was different than the message of the kingdom. The message was different. Jesus brought a different message in grace than he did in the kingdom. Why? The kingdom message belongs strictly to Israel. But the message of grace belongs to whosoever believeth. It ought to bother you that so many today are trying to make the church kingdom thing. It ought to bother you that they could be so ignorant in the scriptures and not rightly divide the kingdom and the church. The church is not going through the tribulation. The church is not going to stay on earth. The church is not going to be an earthly thing. Never was intended to be. Our conversation, he says here, is in heaven. Where our daily walk is. Now, what was God's intention at the cross? His intention was that he would take this living soul and he would bring them through the cross. Our message has already told us who we are. We're in Christ. Christ is our life. But God said, I'll take them through the cross, and what will happen, this believer is not only going to believe that Christ died for their sins, but that believer is going to have to believe that they died also. So what does that do? That takes all of these things that make you who you are. And that pulls them up here to the cross. And everything that you are is going to die here. D-I-E. What is he going to do with Adam? He's going to kill him. You know, it always bothered me when I read over in Genesis about how Adam got in all that mess and, and he disobeyed God and Adam and Eve were in such an awful trial, and I always thought, why didn't God give them a little bit of His grace and cause them to repent of their sin? Would not God have forgiven Adam if he had repented? Sure He would have. But Adam never repented. And so I was left with the thought, well, bad things happened to Adam, but when in the world will Adam ever get straightened out? Ah, He's going to get straightened out 
because every Adamite is going to go through the cross and everything that makes them an Adamite is going to die. Now listen to me. I'm to the core of what our subject will be during this conference. Everything that makes you you was brought through the cross and when he died, it died. Your attitude, your morals, your religion, your talents, they all died. Were new creatures made at the cross? Amen. The cross is not something he did for us. It's something he did to us. He killed us. He killed everything that has to do with a living soul, with Adam. He killed it. He took our desires and he killed them. You didn't know this because you didn't have this gospel. We all got saved. We thought, now I'll be better. I'll be able to do this better, that better. When you come through the cross, we're going to see that that may not be in God's intention at all for you. He's not going to make these things better. He's going to kill them. They're going to die. Philippians 3. We're already there. Let's look at something. Philippians 3. Verse 4. Here's Paul. Personal testimony. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I got a whole lot more. Here's his list. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as teaching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal and persecuted the church, touching righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. But here it is. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Where'd that happen, Paul? Happened at the cross. But I had to find out in my Christian walk what took place at the cross. So he said, gradually, as time went by, I saw the loss of all of these things, everything that made me me. Got another verse down here. Let's see if I can find it. Verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. What's behind that statement? It's this. Paul came to the realization that when he got saved, he couldn't bring this whole mess of who he was over here in Christ. didn't fit. It didn't fit a Christian. It didn't fit God's purpose for his life. So he says that all of these things that made me who I am, I have suffered the loss of for the excellency of the knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge of who I am in Christ. I suffered the loss of all those things. So here's how it works. All of these things come with you as an Adamite when you come to the cross. They're all in you. And God kills them. He doesn't need one thing that makes you you. Not one thing. You understand that? I heard a hillbilly singer not long ago on the television who had turned Christian. And he said, it was a glorious day when I found out the Lord wanted my talent. My first idea was, well, if God's no bigger than this guy, 
But that guy was wrong. God didn't need him. God loved him and wanted him saved, but he didn't need any of his talent. He didn't need anything he had. He just wanted him. So when you bring all of this stuff up to the cross and you go through the cross, it dies. What happens? You come out of the cross a dead man. Oh, you were full of life. Oh, I got this attitude. I got these talents. I got these desires. I got a great vision for the work of the Lord. When you go through the cross, they all die. You come out a dead man. I am crucified with Christ, killed. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, Christ, liveth in me. You see it? Okay, we finally get this old square head over here in Christ. Now his life is not his own. It's not his life anymore. It's not me that lives, it's him. I got that fixed, it's him that lives. Well, I wonder if there's anything about me he likes. Is there anything in me he wants? had somebody say to me one time that had a doctorate degree. They said, I've been in school all my life. Do you think the Lord wants any of that? I said, I don't know, but I doubt it. <laughs> Let me tell you how it works. You're in Christ. Christ is your life. What does Christ need of all this stuff over here you become? What He wills. What He wants. It took me a long time to find that out. I thought God wanted me to be a great evangelist. Did a little bit, not much. Thought He wanted me to be a prophet. Did a little bit, not much. I always was asking God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to be? Only when I came in to this message did I ever know what I was created for. Well, let's say the Lord is gracious and He, he takes a look at you as a human. Maybe you you uh, got a lot, a lot of good points. He doesn't care about those. He wants you to be Christ, not your good points. And He looks over here and He says, Well, that person's got some talent. I can use a little of that. So that goes to be who this brother is. Or he's got some abilities. I can use a little of that. Or he's got some vision. I can use a little of that. It'll take you your lifetime to find out who you are. You're not going to find out what God wants you to be or who you were created to be by asking him to help you in what you are now. After you've been through the cross and you died, you were born again. 